So in case there's people watching that don't know what we're talking about, Dan and I have been here at Hillcrest Lutheran Academy for the last two days uh, and have had the opportunity to be able to share the word for uh, each of us twice and uh, to talk about what 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11 has to say to us. And it's been awesome. We've had a lot of fun and really enjoyed our time here. And uh, it's even uh, even cooler that we get to actually record this podcast with you. So, uh, so we're going to pick it up right there. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Uh, it reads like this. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Then she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. And that's it. That's the whole passage. But in, I think, this passage, there's a few things that Dan and I can hopefully mine out of here, and then we can apply it to your life. Um, so first of all, Dan, why don't we talk about the positioning of this passage? It's always good to sort of, when you're reading the Bible, to get the context of whatever passage you're looking at so that we have a good idea of the flow. You know, the, the, this book, Luke, was authored by the evangelist Luke. And he, um, you know, when you're writing something like this, I mean, he was careful in what he chose to show and tell you happened next. I mean, these things, this is a historical narrative. And so what, what's happening in this overall context here in Luke 10? Uh, well, in Luke 10, this, this comes right on the heels, at least the way that, that Luke places it within the narrative. It comes right on the heels of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, and so the Good Samaritan is a parable where um, a guy falls among robbers, gets beat half to death, left on a road. A priest comes by, passes over the other side of the road. A Levite comes by, passes the other side of the road. Nobody helps really him. Really religious dudes. Yeah, yeah, really religious dudes. They don't help him. Good Samaritan comes along. Uh, well, good is what we call him. A Samaritan who is not someone that Jews liked uh, and definitely wasn't considered good. Was a heretic. Was a heretic. Uh, was uh, a minority. All of those things. And... And he, and he helps, and we, this is known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And most, if, if, if you know anything about the Bible, that's probably one of the things you know. I mean, we have, in, 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 everything is named after the Samaritan. We have Good Samaritan laws. Uh, we have charities named the Good Samaritan, uh, all kinds of things. Samaritan's Purse just collected all their boxes, I think, on Sunday. Yeah, from, from Christmas. Bethel. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. when you hear Samaritan, you don't think that's not good, but they definitely did think that's not good. Yeah. Uh, and he's the guy that ends up helping. And... The parable ends by Jesus asking this guy that he's telling the parable to a question, which he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And he said to him, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So there's this commissioning to go and do. Yeah. Go and do, go and serve, go and, and in this case, the Samaritan, I mean, really risks his life. He sweats. He spends a ton of money. I mean, it, it, the, the, point, the point of it is like sacrifice uh, and, and really go all out for the sake of your neighbor. That's really the point. You go and do likewise. And so I don't think it's an accident that then we come to this passage. After Jesus sort of commissions to go do, we now come across somebody who is doing a lot of things, but maybe not in the right spirit. Well, and I think of when you when you hear Jesus say "go and do likewise," we immediately assume, oh, well, he means go and do things. Um, part of what he means when he says "go and do likewise" is go and be dead and be found and cared for by Christ. And then once you are found dead and cared for by Christ, then go find other people who are dead and care for them as Christ. Uh, it's not just this sort of like go go, be busy. It's not that's not it. There, 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 there's, a very, there's a very specific thing that he's saying. Be like this. He's not saying just go do everything. Go go be occupied. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, well, and, and just to get into the passage now with Martha. So Martha welcomes him into her house. Uh, she's hospitable. But if you look at the words that describe Martha, she does not seem to be a woman at peace. Uh, Martha is said in verse 42 be distracted with much serving. Now, the, the word for distracted there uh, really can convey a sense of being overly busy. And I think each one of us at some point in our life has maybe had this kind of distraction where we've been so busy with so many things that we just are, are sort of overburdened by it all. So she's first of all described as distracted with much serving. She's overly busy with much serving. Secondly, when the Lord answers her after she complains, and we'll get to that in a little bit, he describes her as both anxious and troubled. Anxious and troubled. And uh, so anxious means like worried, you know, overly worried. She's, you know, she feels stressed out. Uh, and this is not what Jesus wants for his people. Well, here's, here's some context. Maybe let, let's, let's take this as a, just so you know, like we, I, we don't do any prep for this. Like this is just, 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 we totally wing this. Um, I think when you, when you're looking at this, at this story, so this comes on the heels of a parable, Mary and Martha are believers in Jesus as the, the promised Messiah. We know this from Lazarus, mm -hmm. and uh, they are people who follow Christ. They are, they are his friends. He, he, goes to their, um, he goes to their house. Now I want you to think about this. And I'm just now thinking about this, but think about this. Say Jesus is coming over to your house. That's super stressful. <laughs> like, you guys live here. Jesus is coming to your room. He's going to hang out for the evening. How much straightening up are you going to do? How, much in, how, how in order do you want things to be? I guarantee that my apartment or my house would be the cleanest it has ever, ever been. Ever. I mean, so, so this is the thing. You're being visited by Jesus. If you've, if you've heard that Jesus was coming to visit you, you'd be like, well, I mean, I need to prepare him a meal. And I can't, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to order, I'm not going to have, you know, I'm not going to do delivery or DiGiorno. I'm not doing either of those things. It's got to, it's got to be better than that. I don't know. It's not going to be, it's got to be better than both of this. Like the house needs to be clean. You want to look put together. I mean, you're hosting God. How put together do you think that your, your life the place where you live, and this is what homes are, the place, they, they, homes are a reflection of your life. How put together do you need this to be for God to come visit you? Well, Martha thinks the same way that you think and the same way that I think, that pretty put together. And, and if and Jesus was there, would you you be trying to wait on him hand and foot? Like, what do you need? Can I do anything? Can I get you another... Another whatever he's, you're serving. Um, and this is what's happening. And so essentially what, what Martha's doing, I don't think is, I think it'd be wrong to roll your eyes and be like, what's she doing? Like, I think you do this. No, she's you, just normal. You, and yeah. you, do, you already do this with people far less than Jesus. You already do this. You already, like, you're already fronting. To other other Christians, to people, to pastors, to people, to leaders, to friends, to whoever that you need to look like you're like you've got it to get more together than you do. That you're more spiritual than you are, and you you already do this. And so, what what uh, while Martha's busy washing the spiritual dishes, uh, Mary is just chilling out. She's just completely she's just sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening. And what you have then is one person who is very busy trying to um, make everything presentable, clean everything up, impress Jesus, or at least not have him think poorly of them. And what ends up happening is she ends up looking at the person who is sitting there, resting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, and what does she do? She ends up looking at that person in frustration, in resentment, 
and aggravation, so much so that then she would appeal to Jesus and say, would you tell, like, I'm the, I'm the only one doing anything here. Yeah. Well, and I, and I would just add here, I mean, if you notice real, I mean, it, being stressed out like this and being overly, it's possible to be so busy serving the Lord that you actually get resentful of other people that don't seem to be serving the Lord as much as you. That's the first thing. And this happens. I mean, I, I've been a pastor for 11 years, and I have met people in every one of the churches I've served that, that do sometimes reflect this attitude, especially sometimes people that are busy a lot at the church that are doing all sorts of the things for the church to make it go. It's very easy to then maybe slide into an attitude where you start looking at others going like, well, mm, you know, well, you weren't here last week when it was really hard to be here. You know, I mean, you can get that kind of... <laughs> You can get that kind of attitude going. but so, so you can begin to resent others. You can begin to, begin to resent the people around you because they're not doing as much or start to think like, well, you know, they might be a Christian, but they're not as fruitful as I am. You know, they're not doing as many things. But you buy, you buy them a, a copy of the book, Not a Fan, for yeah. Christmas, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Here's a copy of Crazy Love. Read it a lot. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, so you've got this sort of you've got this sort of uh, resentment against uh, the other pe- you know the other people around you, but also hidden in here, it's right right in front of your face. She also gets resentful against the Lord. So it's possible to be serving the Lord in all sorts of ways, and meanwhile, be really upset at Him for not seeing all of your busyness. So yeah, root here for Martha. I mean, she says, Lord, do you not care? Do you hear that? I mean, you start, she's starting to worry like all this busyness and he's not making her be busy. Maybe this means that God doesn't care about me as much as that person or my sister in this case. So it's really easy to to get so busy serving the Lord that actually you end up resenting both the Lord and the people around you. And so Jesus has better words for Mary. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things that's actually remarkable about this is that there's actually, this is not a rebuke. Um, Jesus looks at, at Martha and her anxiety and her, her busyness and her trying to make everything just right for him. Um, and these, these, I think these words are words of compassion um, to say, I see that you're anxious and troubled about about many things, uh, but just one thing is necessary. Yeah. Um, like in, other, in other words, like you you can stop all this. You don't you don't have to you don't have to live like this. You don't have to be like this. There's just one thing that's necessary. And Mary has chosen the the good portion, or some translations will say the, the better portion. It's the one thing that's necessary, and that is to what like rest at the feet of Jesus and listen to his to his word, and that will not be taken away. So the idea that, that, he, that even though he has compassion for Martha because that busyness is terrible and he, doesn't, uh, he w- wants her to, the, the plea is to come and join her sister at his feet, um, not to like smack her down or anything, but at the same time is saying, if you think I'm going to tell this person to get up from my feet and to go, go be about the work of cleaning the house and, and impressing me, that's, I'm not taking, I'm not going to do that. I'm not taking this away from her. Maybe I, I could say it this way, and I think this is where it applies specifically to you today. Jesus would much prefer you to be resting and listening at his feet than serving at his feet. Jesus wants you resting at his feet first before any of the serving happens. And I think what happens, much like Martha, is we get it backwards. We think that God is calling us to do all sorts of things for him, but really God is saying, no, no, I just want you. Like this, I just want you. Well, there's plenty of, there'll be plenty of time for Mary and Martha to love and serve their neighbor when Jesus moves on to somewhere else. I think, I think what's really happening here is this. Look, when Jesus shows up, um, whether it's here in the flesh, um, or when he shows up, in, the, in other words, when, when you go to church and he's there in the bread and wine or when you're there listening to his word, um, that is the time to receive. That is the time to listen. That is the time to have him serve. He does not come to be served. 
he says so. He comes to serve. When Jesus shows up, he is not looking for you to do anything but receive. That's that's how he rolls. And so uh, that's, that's the takeaway. There'll be ample opportunities for you to stumble upon the man half beaten uh, and to help him, which is what happened directly. The, the, the Samaritan wasn't like, I better go find someone that's about murdered. Uh, that's not that's not how it happened. Like I mean, when I wake like, up in the, the morning, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, you're like, I better looking find, for the about I better, murdered. I better find somebody who's gonna die if I don't do something. Um, no, this, this, in the story of the Good Samaritan, you see them come upon this man. Like you are not gonna have a shortage of opportunities to love and serve people as long as you're around people. Um, but when Jesus shows up, it's time to sit and receive and listen uh, to his words. Uh, you don't need to impress him. You don't, you don't need to clean everything up and make sure you're presentable. You're not. Uh, so just own it and sit there at his feet. That's, that's, where, that's what yeah, he would you know, it, When I think about Mary here, just the contrast. So Mary is, I mean, Martha's running around, distracted, busy, 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 busy. Uh, Mary, it, the words to describe her, she is seated and listening. That's all. Seated and listening. I would say she was abiding. Yeah, that's what she's doing. It's like, a good thing did you, you like, did you like that, that word, transition? Daniel. Did you like that, that transition? That was a perfect that was transition good. into our next passage, good. John 15. That was not that was non-scripted goodness. <laughs> yeah, that was that was impressive. Uh-huh. So, I mean, but that is what she's doing. That's what abiding is. So, uh, so we come to John chapter 15 and Jesus sort of describes what this looks like in I guess, you know, a little bit more colorful sort of metaphorical terms. He says in John 15, he describes himself this way. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. That's an incredible statement, by the way. And we will get to it. Abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Let me just, why don't we just stop there and unpack first and foremost, how is it Jesus says fruit is going to come? By being connected to the vine. And how do we get connected into the vine? By abiding. (laughs) Oh my gosh, it seems like so simple. Here's the thing, like people will be like, People, if you think about abiding in Christ, you're like, just abide in Christ, which is literally the easiest and most difficult thing in the world to do. Because what abiding, you know what it means to abide? It means to stay. Just to stay right there. That's all it is. If I say, if, it's not telling you to do, it's actually saying, don't do anything. Don't go anywhere. Don't, don't leave. Like, right here, I need you to abide. All right? Um, which sounds like, well, that couldn't be simpler. No, that couldn't be more difficult because what what we want to do is stray all around. Like we we, we like wanna we, we want to get distracted by any number of things. He says, no, you stay right here. If you're in me, you will bear much fruit. And he says, at this, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. In other words. Get to I, it. You don't need to go and clean yourself up or clean up everything because I've already declared you clean. My word has made you clean. I have spoken cleanliness over you. I have imputed it to you. You stay right here close to me. Do not stray from me, right? So you want the lowest pressure statement ever is what he continues to say, which he <laughs> says um, right here, uh, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I, am in, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, Dan, in the Greek, what is that word nothing? It means no things. So, so if, you, <laughs> if you decide that you're like going to get with it and you're going to go Martha to this thing, You'll do exactly no things. Like that's that's the way. And isn't that like the reality of when you're su- like over busy and distracted and anxious? Like you're just spinning and toiling, but you're actually literally doing no things. Right. right. Like this is what happens in real life. Yes. Right. Yeah. So so what what you end up having 
in this text is Jesus saying, while you, when, you're, when you remain close to me, when you, when you do what Mary's doing, like, that's going to bear fruit because it's the only way that fruit gets done. Mm-hmm. You, you can't disconnect yourself from the source of fruit because it, it's not your fruit. It's, it's something that God is doing in you. He is the one bearing it. They, that's, that's how this whole thing works. And so, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not an accident, you know, I mean, sometimes we just read things, you know, that uh, even, you know, in the Bible, and we just sort of say them, and we don't take a moment to just think about it. But remember this, when Paul talks about fruit, for example, the Apostle Paul, what does he say? He says, it is the fruit of the Spirit. Whose fruit? The Spirit's fruit. It's also one fruit. It's not the fruits of the spirit. Yeah, one uh, fruit. Like, have you ever seen these like uh, these posters that have like a bunch in of every different Sunday school room? Yeah, ever they got like a bunch of ever. they got like a bunch of yes. different fruits on them, like the banana of self control and like yeah. and, the, and the pomegranate of of humility. Yeah, I and, always love the pomegranate of humility. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, that's not what that text says. It says the fruit of the spirit, like the singular fruit, because the fruit of the spirit. Read the fruits of the, the fruits. Read the fruit. Read the fruit. <laughs> Of the Spirit, and, and look at that list, and you know what you'll find? You'll be like, that sounds like Jesus. And you're like, yeah, that's because that, what's a, what that is, that the fruit of the Spirit is Christ in you, coming out of you, and he's one person, and he has all of that going on. It is the Holy Spirit bearing forth the characteristics of Christ. He's the one doing it. He's not a banana and a pomegranate. He's just the Son of God. Yeah. Uh, doing that. I'm so glad that you did not say he's only a banana or one or the other. That's no. good. Like, no, he is I just, know. yeah. I know. He is the son of God, yes. But it, but, so. I, but here's the, the, the crazy thing is, like, all of this stuff, what Jesus does over and over, and what the New Testament does is it turns everything upside down for you because all of a sudden you start realizing when you start looking at these two passages and, and correlation, you're like, wait a minute. R- rest is not the enemy of bearing fruit. Rest is the is the foundation of bearing it's fruit. It's the only it's the only way that any fruit's ever going to happen. If you if you subtract rest rest in Christ sitting at the feet of Christ from you will do you will do no things. So the sworn enemy of fruit bearing is not too much rest. The sworn enemy of fruit bearing is you just trying to do too much stuff on your own. You thinking that you can somehow clean all this up and you can bear this fruit and you can you can muster it up and if you just get a little bit more devoted, you can do it. No, like you will, it's a promise, you will bear fruit. You will give, be given oppor- like when you think about when you think about good works, Paul says in Ephesians that you are saved and redeemed and that God has prepared good works beforehand for you to walk in them. What does this mean? This means that the works that he has you to do, he has already prepared and you're going to walk right into them. You're not, you're not going to have to figure out like, I better be doing. Like he's like, no, I'm gonna, I got things for you to do. You stay close to me and we're going to hit those right in stride. Like yeah. they, I, already, I already have them prepared. Yeah. Uh, things get things get weird when you decide to go do your own thing over here or to try to impress me. Don't don't do that. You don't have to impress me. Like stay close. Well, and we'll and, get some stuff done. And in both the passages in Luke Luke ten and in John fifteen, I think one of the things that's key is to note that the same thing is is happening that causes this abiding, this connection to the vine. And in both places, it's the word. So in John fifteen three. He says, you're clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And what's Mary doing when we come across her in Luke 10? She is listening to the word of Jesus. And so the word, as we receive the word that is proclaimed to us, the word of Christ come for us, lived, died, resurrected for us, for us, for us, well, that produces in us this abiding quality, this ability to just stay put and then God does his work. He produces fruitfulness through us. Exactly. Yeah. So, so there's not, I mean, we, could, we can go on just a little bit further in John uh, 15, but I think, um, you know, it's a promise. I'll skip down to verse 8. He says, By this my Father is glorified, 
that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Stay put right there. Yeah. But Eric, there's this problem that's coming up right here. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you that you may, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now, that kind of seems like Jesus just told you that you needed to abide and sit at his feet and rest, and, and that's, that was going to get it done. With, and he handed that to you and with his right hand, and then right as you reached out to get it, he snatched it away with his left hand and said, if you keep my commandments, I'll love you. Here's the thing. First of all, when we hear commandments, what we think of is like the Ten Commandments or something like that. This is, this is not what this means. Um, what this means is uh, the, word, the, the even the Ten Commandments. That's a word we've get, that's a phrase that we've given them. We've titled them that. It's the ten words from God. That's what that's what the word in in Hebrew means. It's God's ten words. Um, and here is it's much like that. That the commandments are all the things that God has said. The, the, command, the commandments of God, the Torah, the, the sayings of God, the things that have proceeded from the mouth of God, including the Ten Commandments and all the other things that he says, right? So when you see something like this, think, don't think, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Think all that God has said, okay? That's the first thing. Another thing is this. Keep doesn't mean do. I know you think it does, but it doesn't. Um, if I hand you something and say, will you keep this for me? I'm not asking you to do anything but have that close to you. That's it. If I hand you my phone and say, or keys or whatever and say, keep these for me, all I expect you to know is where that's at. <laughs> okay? What, what keep means, in the, in the word here, I don't want to get too nerdy here, but like in the Greek... This okay. is this is the word that we get the word keep from. Like, think about um, you ever heard of uh, like a keep, like a castle, right? Like a like a it's like a place where you or or a dungeon, right? So it's like a place where things are contained. It's a keep, a king's keep, right? That's where that word comes from. And so when we when we translate keep, what we mean is this. He says, "Keep my commandments, keep my words." What this means is not that if you do everything that I told you, which you, will, you won't, uh, that I will love you. What he means is keep all the things that I've said the way that Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the words that proceed from his mouth. Do not stray far from what I have said, which includes the promise that I love you. Like you keep that. You keep those words. You don't, don't go far from those words. You need to keep those. It's not about, and, 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 and even with the commandments, with the Ten Commandments, it's not necessarily him saying, if you don't do these things, I won't love you. But it's him saying, like, the people that love me, they don't reject these things. So they don't, they don't say, like, oh, I don't need to listen to that. I don't need to hear that. Mm -hmm. I don't need those words. No, it says that we, you agree with. You're like, yep, the word of God, that's, I stay close to that. Yeah, it's so important that we recognize the word is the source from which all of these things come. And that's 30 minutes, Dan. That's 30 minutes. We've got to leave you right there because, yeah. unfortunately, this does have to air, and we promise people it's 30 minutes. So thanks for coming out, and we will. you can listen to this later. So yeah. go, go to iTunes, thanks, subscribe, do all these. You can clap. That's fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, do all those things. Also, so these stickers, you just grab these. Um, I'll have to go out to the car which you park. I don't, I, I don't know why we didn't do this before. Me and Eric wrote this book together. It's called Scandalous Stories. It's a sort of commentary on parables. It's very lay level. It's easy for any, anybody in here could understand it. It's not um, super um, theologian. -y yeah, we're not scholarly. Um, if you want, if you want this, um, I will bring some in. If you want it, um, and uh, it's, it's ten bucks if you want it. So if you want to do that, you can. Or you know, if you're like, oh, I don't have ten bucks, you can get it on Amazon if you want to get it later. But Thanks for coming out, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah.